a little digression to remind you of an of a amusing bit of history. Back in the 18th century, a very clever man named von Kempelen made his Turk, his chess playing Turk. This was an automaton that played chess, and von Kempelen would exhibit it, first exhibit it, I think, to, to Maria Theresa in her castle. Uh, he'd open up the, the, the cupboard doors and show you all the machinery inside. He'd turn the big crank, and then this wooden mannequin would play chess, and it played winning chess. It beat, it, it beat the best chess players in the court. It beat some of the best chess players in Europe. And so he exhibited this. This was a, when you paid to, to get in to see it, it was, a, it was, it was quite a show. And uh, uh, people were fascinated with it. When, when, uh, uh, when uh, von Kempelen died, it was sold uh, to uh, uh, another uh, German named Melzel, who toured it in Europe and also brought it to the United States, um, uh, where it was unmasked by none other than Edgar Allan Poe who was a young reporter, an investigative reporter, and a good skeptic. And he was just sure that there, you couldn't make a machine that played winning chess. And he eventually, through careful detective work, managed to figure out what was going on. And sure enough, there's a little man inside. <laughs> there was a human chess player. It didn't have to be too small. And what Melzel did was that he hired and conspired with a very good chess player. Whom, whom he brought to the United States, separate passage on another ship, or at least in a, you know, they did not talk to each other on the ship, and they traveled in separate trains, and arrived at the theater separately, and all the rest, and then he would sneak in. Interesting how, how Poe caught it, by the way. The clue, the give giveaway clue was that, that whenever uh, Melzel exhibited the Turk, there was always a candelabra with lit candles on the, on the table, rather like Liberace playing the piano. And he wondered why that candelabra was there, and he finally figured out what it was. This was all pre-electricity, of course. Inside the box, the chess player needed a candle to see what he was doing. And the smell of candle smoke would have been a giveaway if it hadn't been for that candelabra on the top. So a nice, clever move. Well, now, Poe thought it was flat impossible for a mindless machine to play chess. That's what motivated and, and fueled his investigation. Well, he was wrong. It isn't. As we know to this day, because Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov for the world, the world champion in chess just a few years ago. A moral that we might draw from this is that there may be a little man inside Deep Blue, but if so, he may well be sound asleep because he doesn't have any work to do. The machine can do all that work. Now, many people think that it's impossible for a mindless process to produce evolution, too. And it isn't. That's what Darwin shows. And we might even draw the conclusion that if there is an intelligent God hidden in the evolution process, he might just as well be asleep since there's no work for him to do. <laughs> Yes, that's the import, is that the process of natural selection, this mechanical algorithmic process of natural selection, will do all the work. That's what he's saying. Now, here's a question. Were there colors on this planet before there was color vision? To make it sort of vivid, let's, let's imagine a, 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 a cliff. This is the Vermilion Cliff out west in the United States. There's some, some stripes there in, in red. And were those stripes visible three million, two billion years ago? What do you mean, were they visible? There was nothing with eyes then. Uh, well, we can answer the question by saying, well, but if there were things with eyes, the stripes would have been visible if the eyes had color vision. But what if they didn't? Um, is that, are those boundaries visible? Well, if there's colorblind people in the audience, then to you, the, the boundaries aren't visible. If, 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 uh, if you all have color vision, then you can see the, the boundaries. The very question of whether those boundaries is visible can only be answered when we say what kind of an eye we're talking about. That doesn't mean that color is a subjective property. It's just a subjective as you could make it, 
It's just that it's a property that we can't really define independently of some particular class of property detectors or seers. Uh, uh, and I want to suggest that the same thing is true about this question. Were there reasons before there were reasoners? The answer I'm going to give is yes, in the same way that there were colors before there was color vision. Now, this is an amazing juxtaposition. On the left, we see a termite castle. On the right, we see Antonio Gaudi's famous La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. They are stunningly similar. They are artifacts made by animals. And yet, I want to claim, although they are superficially very similar, the processes by which they were designed and built are hugely different. Stunningly different, and understanding that difference is the key to this talk. Now here's two other sand castles. The one on the right is the work of the same species as the Sagrada Familia, and it's, we know quite a lot about it. The one on the left is remarkable, because it is the work of a single-celled creature, an amoeba. No nervous system, no brain, it's just one cell. And yet, it makes this little house quite remarkable. Now let's look at another sand castle that's made by this creature, caddis fly larva. There's its sand castle, it's a, it's a food sieve, which it builds in the moving water in a stream and then uses it to catch food. And you can see how elegantly it's designed. Uh, uh, not only does it have the nice funnel for the water to come in and another one to go out, but it has this extra passage, you can see it here on the top view, so that it can get both sides of the screen and yet have the screen blocking off the, the, the interior passage. That's very well designed. In fact, in some regards, I think it's better designed than this, which is another way of getting food out of water using a sort of sieve. Both of these things are really quite wonderfully designed. What's the difference? Well, I want to say there's reasons for the arrangement of the parts in both cases. In the caddis larva's food sieve, there are reasons, and in the lobster trap. The difference is that in the caddis case, the reasons are not represented anywhere. They're not represented in the caddis larva's little nervous system, and they're not represented in the process of natural selection that designed the caddis larva's nervous system, but they are the reasons nonetheless. They're what I call the free-floating rationales of evolution. I've been using this term for a number of years, and I don't know, I think probably it was not a well-chosen term because a lot of people just, just hate it or they just, they, they don't, they think I'm talking about something mysterious. So one of my main purposes here is to demystify the notion of free-floating rationales of evolution. And I'm going to use one of my favorite examples, which is the cuckoo chick. Cuckoos, as you know, I know I'm here in this department of ecology and evolutionary biology and there's bird experts in the room. So I'm, I'm carrying calls to Newcastle here, but some of you may not know about this. So, so cuckoos are brood parasites. They don't make their own nests and they don't incubate their own eggs. When the female cuckoo is ready to lay her egg, she finds a host nest, some other species, a thrush or a warbler, and she waits until they have finished their nest and laid their eggs, and then when they fly off to feed, she darts down really quick, lays her egg, pushes one of the, uh, one of the, of the host eggs out, that's in case the host can count. <laughs> yes, that's the reason. And flies off, never to return. The hosts come back, they incubate the egg, then they feed the chick when it's born. 